being a Trekkie as I am, and, you know, I can say that because I've watched pretty much all of it ever, um, mm -hmm. the good, the bad, and the unfortunate. <laughs> well, there's um, plenty of that. Looking at you, Star Trek nemesis. But the Star Trek movie, the new one, it, it was, like I said, it it is a good movie on its own merits. Like, if you just watch it as a movie, yeah. I loved it. Mm -hmm. I thought it was great. It was a good action movie. It was all sci-fi. It had plot development. It was good stuff. But, like, as a traditional Trekkie, so looking at it as a Star Trek movie, I still can't say it was bad. That's not what I'm trying to argue, that it was bad. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying that it really kind of messed with the whole feel, the vibe of the Trek a little bit, at least for me. Like, Star Trek was not supposed to be about laser gun shooty time. That was like my problem with Nemesis and the other later movies where they tried to turn it into an action adventure when Star Trek never was an action adventure. Well, that's the thing is that, you know, sci-fi kind of shifted around the time of, say, uh, Star Wars. It, it changed from uh, the more slow, contemplative 2001 Space Odyssey type of movie that you got maybe with the first Star Trek movie, and it instead shifted to the um, Star Wars, you know, pew, pew, pew type movie. But, like, Star Trek The Next Generation didn't do that. They were very, very much on the whole philosophical bent, the exploration of greater ideas using the sci-fi setting as a sort of canvas. Wherein, like, Star Trek The Next Generation battles were not very action-y, really. They were usually more true to the idea of spaceship combat is boring. Hmm. You know, like, it's not shit racing around everywhere and zappy pew pew pew, it's fire phasers, you know? And there's a, some moments of, like, oh no, they're maneuvering against us and stuff, but for the most part, the episodes were never about the battles at all. It was about the philosophical ramifications of whatever situation they were exploring. Stuff going on with Data, trying to become more human, or... I mean, or like lot, when they like, discover another alien race that has a particular issue, what it really is trying to do, the show has always tried to do this, is use the alien situation as a sort of canvas to paint our own issues on. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, uh, individual planet has specific uh, one, maybe two dimensional political uh, issue type idea. Yes. And that's how the episodes would work. But... You know, like you mentioned with the battles, they were more or less strategy and very yeah. often supplanted with a lot of the, um, you know, well, let's do this random science-y backwards mumbo-jumbo talk to, you know, decouple the regulators from the engineering bay. Or, as they would say in Star Trek, you know, invert the tachyon field. <laughs> um. <laughs> Or, like, in the fucking... Oh, God. Or if it? it's Voyager, you know, modify the deflector dish. That's how they solve everything. <laughs> is they modify the deflector dish until it's a Swiss fucking army knife, you know? Yeah, we, uh, in uh, Next Generation, in the, uh, the first contact in that movie, they talk that about was another how movie we're, we're going to take the... We, we have matched the uh, signature of the chronometric particles so that we can go back in time. Yes, that's bullshit. So that we can go back to our original time. We, we, it, we, it's again. It's just making it up as you well, go. <laughs> it's sci-fi bullshit. Like, yeah. if you look at most of the fight sequences, especially in like the original Star Trek, they were almost kind of hammy. Like, they were ridiculous in a way. Like, you were watching Kirk, like you know, axe handle somebody, and you're just like, that's not a really good move. <laughs> but it the fights weren't the important thing. The fights were actually just a little bit of drama interspaced between the philosophical contemplation that the episode was taking on. So your issue with the movie is more or less that it wasn't true to the original in that feel? Mm-hmm. So... Like I said, it's not a bad movie. It's just the feel of it was very much like a action-adventure sci-fi romp. And I like action-adventure sci-fi romps. It's just not what I want from a Star Trek movie. What I want from a Star Trek movie can be much better encapsulated from movies like the original Star Trek movies, you know, like one through six. So, well, with varying degrees, of course, because not all of them were great either. But. but but can you not appreciate the fact that this is starting a new franchise with its own feel? I can, but at the same time, I am a fan of the old material. 
And I cannot and so it separate feel, it, that. It has that uh, emotional impact of feeling like a type of betrayal. Not even a betrayal. I'm not going to be an ingra- no, 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 angry fan. No, 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 but you, you get my... Uh, I do. Yeah. But I'm not, you know, another thing I want to make clear is I'm not going to be one of those ingrate fans. He's like, ah, you can't ever touch the thing again because it was perfect in its original form. Get off and, my lawn, yeah. you damn kids. It's not even that. It's just, as a personal Star Trek fan, I feel that the movie changed the vibe in a direction that is not what I wanted. And that, again, it's not like I'm saying the movie's bad at all. The movie was good. It's just, it wasn't what I expected from a Star Trek movie. Mm-hmm. And, you know, to make a side point on Nero, because I did not like Nero as a villain. I did not relate to him. And sure, his planet blew up. That sucks, right? But in Star Trek history, we have planets that blow up and people that need to be moved around and that sort of thing. And, yeah, it sucks for them, too. But, you know, they don't decide to attack the people that wanted to help them. That's my biggest thing here is that Spock went there to the Romulan planet to try to save them. Now, that was a Federation peace mission, but the Vulcans were the ones specifically doing all this red matter research and doing all this stuff with it, so Nero's plan is attack the people that went out of their way to help us. Why was it again that it was specifically after Spock to begin with? Why did he blame him? Because Spock didn't save his planet in time. You know, his planet still blew up, but he tried to save them, but he didn't do it in time. And so he blames them for not getting there in time, basically. Crying which, a fucking river. Exactly. That's why I can't sympathize with the guy, because his vengeance issues are so completely misdirected that it's lunacy. I'm, go- I'm going to travel through space and time to get back at a guy who never who I feel jilted by even though he didn't fucking do anything He didn't do wrong. anything to hurt them. Like, he actually had nothing... Spock had nothing but the best intentions. Like, if you look through the continuity of old Spock, you know, he was actually for, like, the Romulan reunification effort and stuff. He was a big supporter of Federation help to Romulans. And he is exactly the last person that should be targeted here. But then again, I mean... Well, I mean, we can kind of hand wave that away with Nero was a bit cracked in the head from all he went through. Yeah. Which, you know, again, fine, he's a villain, he can be cracked in the head, and his logics don't have to work. He just did what he did, right? Villains do what they do. Mm -hmm. And again, I get that, and, uh, you know, I'm not going to sit there and say, oh, Nero ruined the movie, but... He, He is a stain on it for you. Yes. Yeah. And I think the core of it, really, even beyond the whole feel issue, is just that I think the movie tried too hard to be pretty. Like... Lens flare everywhere. Yeah. Like, and, yeah. And, like, again, it detract. It didn't ruin the movie, but it detracted again because, like, I watched the original Star Trek, like, you know, from the 60s. Mm-hmm. And people like, oh, well, the special effects are horrible. So fucking what? That's what an imagination's for. Like, <laughs> I watch, you know, oh, well, that the Horda monster from the one episode with the silicon nodules, the fans will know what I'm talking about. But, yeah, sure, the monster looked pretty ridiculous and stupid. It didn't matter, though. It didn't matter, because they were telling a story, and they used a visual prop to convey their story. And if you were willing to just use your imagination and say, well... That is a stand-in for what they were trying to convey with their limited technology. Use your imagination a little bit, you know, and soup it up in your head, I guess. Can not all of us who started out on, like, the Nintendo and the Super Nintendo appreciate that you use your imagination to enhance this thing that you're doing and watching? Exactly. So, like, I don't care about the graphics so much. I don't care about how pretty they made the Enterprise look, or how amazing the CG is. That's secondary, at best, in my issues. Because I have an imagination. I'm willing to use it. You know, the movie can look like crap. But if it's telling a great story with decent acting and a good writing system involved, then I'm for it. 
you can you can almost find the bad effects and the you know bad blue screen this that and the other endearing about exactly. it. Exactly. It's well, in essence, like I'm a book reader, yeah. and there are no visuals to it unless you're reading an illustrated book. You know, it's all in your head, and that's sort of I think a training that more people could benefit from. It's it's it's, just, a, it's sad that so often people have their views of a book colored by seeing the movie first and the characters uh, from the movie carry over to how they see the character in the book even though they're described as looking completely different. Yes. And... I think... At the, at the same time, of course, it... it yes, we are... Focus. It. Yes, you know, don't address the gunshot wounds. Your clothes are getting dirty with blood. We are kind of doing that when it comes to the movie because, yeah, overall, good movie. Yeah, great I'm not, fucking movie. Great I'm not epic gonna, sci-fi. Good times. Yeah, and stuff. I'm not trying to detract from that in the least. But what I am trying to say though is just that, as a Star Trek nerd, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way a little bit. Like it was a little bit of, okay, yeah, I like it, but. These things could have been different, and you know, on the on the special effects thing, I mean, the Star Wars prequels. Need I say more? Like, the Star Wars prequels are a great example of how to fuck something up, though. Like that, those were bad movies. Just flat. Yeah, they, it wasn't like a. Well, I like the original Star Wars movies, and I can still appreciate the new ones. But no, no, it's just that this is a bad movie. Speaking on cinema. You know what, by the way, just as a note for anybody watching, is down in the description there will be a link to the best way for you as older people to have your children view the Star Wars movies, which is the machete method. Basically, it cuts out the first movie, and you watch them like uh, four, five, two, three, six. And it is a great method of watching it uh, much better than just watching them in fucking order, which is... I would just recommend you watch 4, 5, and 6. Yeah. And leave it there. By the way, Disney owns Star Wars. What do you think? Uh, my opinion on that is, you know what? Especially based on the decisions they've made for who is going to be directing it and such, it's looking like it has a lot of potential. It looks like, especially if they decide to actually follow the book's um, based on uh, what I've heard, like you know, it's like they, if they follow the books that happened maybe like twenty years right after the end of the original movies. Well, I can also speak authoritatively on extended universe Star Wars, mm -hmm. being a fucking nerd as shit and having read a lot of those books in my time. A yeah, lot. See, I'm just going based off of what I've heard from other people, but I think that basically you can't deny the fact that. Disney does have a penchant for these epic movies. And it's just a question of whether or not they're going to ruin them. And I don't think that you can really judge it, obviously, yet. No. So, at this point, there's just a lot of potential there. Here's and my... I think we should be hopeful, at well, least. Well, I am. Because let's let's not pretend so that, that there's a lot of discussion on this, of course, but there's this sort of idea that, oh, it's going to be ruined now. Leia's going to be the new Disney prince. But see, here's, what's, here's what people are omitting. Did you miss the movies one through three? It's a lit, little too late for that bus of, what if it ruined Star Wars? No, the bus has already left. <laughs> George that Lucas train, did it himself. That train has already reached its destination at this point. Movies one through three exist, and when people say, well, they're going to ruin it, what more can they do? <laughs> they put Jar Jar in there. Like, Jar Jar is not an extended universe, so if they follow extended universe, it's already a victory. <laughs> like, I mean, to be fair, extended universe is sort of uh, the movies 4, 5, and 6 again. Like, I'll be honest, um, spoilers, by the way, for the extended universe, if anybody even cares, I don't know, but... Uh, you know, like, Luke, you know, like, uh, Han and Leia have kids, and then, um, they have two kids, or three, I think, yeah, three, but there's twins that are first, and then one of the twins goes evil, and the other has to redeem them from the dark side, and it's sort of like the first three movies again, mm -hmm. where the... And then, you know, Luke becomes corrupted again at one point, the Emperor gets revived, it's, it's a big... Hullabaloo, and a lot of it is sort of reviving 
the things that already existed in the franchise and almost retelling the story. But there are a lot of cool things in there. I oh, mean, there this, are. This like, is something that I've only uh, heard of, so I'm just curious if you can confirm it for me, is um, that at one point, Luke actually makes a literal, physical, alternate Millennium Falcon as a decoy using the Force. Well, actually, towards the primacy of uh, the whole Luke saga in the extended universe, he's the most powerful being in the universe. That's really. what I was thinking. Yeah, yeah he, he really is the um, what they thought Anakin was. Yes. Yeah. He's well, actually, of... that's sort of a theme that they're trying... that was neat, but I don't think Lucas actually intended it originally, was that that guy who was supposed to bring balance to the Force was Anakin by giving birth to Luke. By extension type yes, thing. Yes, yeah. basically he was the one to create the balance by being the father of that, the Messiah. <laughs> <laughs> what? That's what it is. It's a Jesus allegory. Let's yeah. not even mince words. Ugh, God. So Anakin is God. In a, well, no. No. But yeah, I mean, either way, we have plenty of reason to be hopeful, especially based on the standard that's already been set at this point. Well, the biggest thing is that it's new, and it has potential, and to sit there and judge it beyond a certain fact is absurd. There's nothing to judge exactly. yet. Exactly. It hasn't happened yet. How, how can you judge it when you, there's nothing to judge I mean, yet. like I like to make fun of it in a sense, Disney Star Wars, right? It's fun to poke at that because it sounds ridiculous, but... In reality, it's probably one of the best things to happen to the franchise, you know, since the first movies. For the the real first movies, not one, two, and three. For the simple fact of removing George from the fucking equation, you've improved it exponentially. Well, for the like, fact that he is the one that basically fucked everything up with the first with the with the prequels. Well, I think a simple thing to note here is that George Lucas is good at ideas, but bad at writing. He is good at creating a backdrop. Like, mm -hmm. his setting was pretty cool. I mean, that's a given. Like, the Star Wars setting is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. And even in the first three episodes, the setting is pretty neat still. Yeah. The problem is, though, the first three movies had him as the head of everything, where in movies four, five, and six, he was part of a team. He had people over his head, in a sense. Hmm. But with movies one, two, and three... He had unlimited reign to do what George Lucas does, which is god-awful writing and dialogue. Yeah. God-awful writing. He's one of the most literal dialogue people ever when it comes to making his characters express themselves. They must say exactly what they are feeling in the most literal terms, because otherwise I guess the audience will miss it. And, well, I'm sorry, but when you take that part of the equation and add on to it the fact that most of the prequels when it comes to like just all character development is Jedi walking on blue screens yes and having conversation when so much of it is fucking dialogue driven but it, it's not even dialogue really that's my point. It's a ham-fisted attempt at dialogue that's so... It's almost like George Lucas is a sociopath who doesn't quite understand human interaction. And so I'm going to make an amalgamation of it as best as possible that... You know. I almost feel like before he must have written the dialogue for movies 4, 5, and 6. And some guy went and looked at his script and said, What the fuck? And then wrote some better dialogue. And then, of course, Harrison Ford fixed a little bit of it. Oh, yeah. Well, of course. I mean, like, that line, the I know, that was something George Lucas couldn't have done. He couldn't have added that amount of humanity into the character. George like... Lucas would have had him do the original plan line, I love you too, Ooh. which was not Han Solo at no. all. Han Solo keeps his cool. Han Solo doesn't get mushy. And Harrison Ford got that. George Lucas didn't, and George Lucas wrote the fucker. <laughs> That's the point, though, right there, is that, yeah, George Lucas is the guy who supposedly created the character and yet missed the character. <sighs> Although, I mean, let's take a moment here real quick to demystify a little bit of that Star Wars thing. Movies 4, 5, and 6 were good, mm -hmm. but they are not the most amazing sci-fi epic ever written bar none with the greatest shining star of hope for every fantasy ever. Like, 
Sometimes I hear people talk about Star Wars like it was manna from the heavens delivered by God on golden DVDs, you know? It's a classic epic, sure. But for fuck's sake, people. Like, let's, let's be I, real. I'm sorry, but me personally, I don't really like Star Wars. I don't really enjoy it that much. It's not my thing. And that's fine, and it should be so. It, is, it should not be held up as the pinnacle of all fucking sci-fi. But if you feel that way personally, everybody has different tastes, that's fine. Sure. But, objectively speaking, you have to understand it is a story, rough but well told in a sense, but at the same time, it's still rough. It's still shaky at times, dialogue's iffy, you know, and like... Well... The early cuts, if anybody has the joy of still watching the original un... You know, special edition... Yeah, un editions. special edition, deluxe, reducto, EXDX, Supreme style... Laser version. disc, whatever yeah. the fuck release. The original, you can see some fun little errors happen in that movie. Like a stormtrooper walking around on the Death Star smacks his head into a ceiling. And it's in the final cut. <laughs> There's other things like that, too. The movie's rough, it's unpolished, but that's part of its charm. Exactly, I was about but to say, that's an endearing aspect of it. Let's not call it what it isn't. Let's not sit there and say it is a perfect movie. Because uh, I love Star Wars, but it is a flawed movie, and let us accept it for that. A great epic, good story, flawed. <laughs> then again, anybody who says just about anything is perfect is wrong. wrong. Of course, because nothing is perfect. 